Hey gang. Whoops, hang on, hang on. Oh, oh forgive me. A technical glitch has just arisen. Hey, Uncle. Um, I'm sorry. Whoops, uh, the sound. Um, forgive me. I'm going to go with the. Uh, the mic as it is, ambient sound. Terribly sorry, terribly sorry to do that to you, which means the quality will not be as good. Um, when you update an app, uh, sometimes all kinds of crazy things can happen. So let me pull myself together, have that, that sudden bad thing that happened, and say this is daily out of inch number, no. <laughs> Have it. Dan's Art Adventure, number 28, continuing two wedding paintings. All right, so here's the two paintings. Uh, this one I did uh, nine days ago, and this one I did two days ago. I'll talk about them each separately. And just want to give you some idea. You can, even though I didn't broadcast uh, me doing this, uh, you can go back in my channel and watch me start a number of, a lot of wedding paintings if you if you want to watch that but what i haven't done too much of is what do i do with the painting once i get once i get home in my own studio and i almost always start the same way and that is by doing a glaze so that you understand this is all dry right it was dry a day and a half after it was done because i used fast dry oil mediums. Um, I have one, uh, two photographs that give me a rough approximation of what this scene looked like. This was a, 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 a wedding essentially in Roanoke, Virginia, and it was inside a tent. So you can see the, the near edge of the, I had to do quite a bit of reconstruction in other words, the, the the scene did not look exactly like this. I moved the I moved the dance floor, you know, twenty feet to the right. I brought this curtain and a, a flower pot into the near corner just for composition. These are the curtains gathered around the poles, the tent poles, you know, on the far side of the tent. And the tent is clear, transparent, not, so it's not a white tent, it's a clear tent, but let me show you the photograph, maybe you can see it better from there. And then inside the clear plastic tent, they suspended this sheer fabric, all right? Does that make sense? So I'm trying to indicate here sheer fabric. And um, one of the interesting things about this particular painting Usually, when I when I uh, start doing a when I begin sorry for stumbling when I begin to do a glaze, I usually here's the way my mind works. I and you've heard me do this before if you watched many of I, I say to my students, you must say this. I like it pretty much, even if you don't like it. You have to say I like it, and I just wish it was more blank. And the blank is a color. Now the challenge here is, uh, this is the way the painting was when I packed it up at the end of the night and began driving home. Uh, and ironically, I like the, I'm having a hard time saying, filling in that blank. I wish it was more blank. So, because I think it's actually pretty close. So I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, I'm going to, uh, do a, a glaze, a warm yellow orange, red orange glaze up here where the tent is. Because I think, okay, maybe the tent, yeah, yeah, the tent could be a little bit more. It was sort of peach colored fabric up there. Okay, and then down where the tent is not, I'm gonna mix up a slightly different color. This is way too intense, but don't panic. Don't. So I'm doing uh, Indian yellow, by the way. 
which traditionally Indian yellow was made from camel pee, and they forced the the force fed the camels on some kind of plant. I forget now what the plant was, but that was the tradition. That is the traditional recipe for Indian yellow is camel urine, where the camels had been force fed some yellow flower. <laughs> I don't think that's how it's made anymore. <laughs> I'm quite sure, as a matter of fact, I've looked it up. All right, and then this is too intense, so this is why I say not to worry. I'm going to remove as much as I want. I'm not gonna remove all of it, of course, but I'm gonna remove as much of that Indian yellow as I want by how, how hard I push and how long I rub. Does that make sense? And so I've, I've backed it off just about to where I want it, I think. Now, again, I'll do this again in a few minutes on the other wedding painting, and you'll probably see a more dramatic, uh, a more dramatic difference. But I'm going to do a little bit more glazing, and this is fairly typical. I'm doing glazing uh, on a second day on any painting, not just wedding paintings. Um, I, I very often will darken the corners. That's called a vignette, of course. So I turn that into a verb. I am vignetting the corner. It's already been done somewhat, but yes, I, I believe it. I believe it. It can stand to be. Uh, darkened even more. And I'm doing that uh, with an oxide red, which is a, of course, a, a reddish brown color, and dioxazine violet, or purple, if you will. What ordinary people call purple. <laughs> I find it's a bit much when artists always insist on using the chemical name for their it's okay to say purple. <laughs> okay, so right at the moment I'm darkening. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, now that I'm doing it, I'm saying, oh yeah, that, that, this part up here, because this is essentially outside the tent. I'm standing outside the tent looking in. Here's the nearby curtain. Here's the near edge looking through the tent. And this is the, the bride's parents' house. Okay, and I, again, even though this, this corner has already been darkened significantly, this flower pot, I think, doesn't need to be quite that prominent. You can still see it, but I don't want it jumping off the canvas too much. A little bit of drawing here. How about this corner? This corner is almost as dark as it needs to get. <clears throat> All right, so I think I'm done with the glazing. Now, let me talk. I'm, I'm not going to do much more than that on this painting. Um, this is an unusual wedding painting in that the bride firmly requested that I capture the essence of the evening and the setting and not make the bride and groom too big and not realistic. So I have a photograph here. I am fairly busy, uncle. I just discovered a, a wise advisor told me yesterday that I need to modify my contract regarding travel costs. And he suggested very wisely that I do an asterisk and say temporary travel costs adjustment. We hope and pray it's temporary, right? Because of the prices of gas. I have several weddings uh, this summer in New Jersey and New York, even north of New York City. So I'll be driving like four weddings, maybe five, and one to Florida. So I've got a lot of driving. And now it's too late for everybody who's already signed a contract, but this is for any upcoming. Anyway, so I'm not going to do this with you watching. But I am going to try to capture the bride and groom more accurately. Let me show you how they are right now. Uh, they're ugly right now, but that's how much time I had to do the night of the reception. 
So I want them to be accurate, but still abstract. So as you can imagine, that's, that's going to be quite a challenge, right? Abstract, but accurate. That is a challenge. In some ways, it's more difficult than doing super realism in some ways. But anyway, so that's, but that's all I'm going to do on this one, because I want to take you to the other paintings. So this will be dry, actually, in, a, in an hour or two. And uh, if I were going to be here at home, I could continue uh, on that painting, and it would be dry. You, I, I don't have to wait for it to dry. But. All right, now here's the other wedding. I did this uh, just uh, Saturday evening, day before, two days or three days ago. This is being Monday here. And um, this was uh, in fun in, in a, one sense. It was my first Mexican wedding. The whole night was in Spanish. The whole reception was all the music, loud music, <laughs> was in Spanish. Now, a number of the people that were there, um, most of them spoke English, and I had a delightful time talking to a lot of people, of course. But publicly, the, the, broad, the, the, the uh, voice on the, you know, on the sound system, on the amplified sound was all in Spanish. That was fun. They're both Spanish, bride and groom. And there were about, I would say about 15% of the that big, big uh, reception, 300 maybe, 15% maybe white, white people, Caucasian, um, and 10% black maybe anyway so it was a fun racial mix and I was delighted to do to be able to do um, a Hispanic couple and I do think I will be able to retain uh, um, a, 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 a that it should be especially he fairly obvious that he's Hispanic is a very well let me show you the, some the picture that I have Oh, I didn't print out a, a, a large image. But I'll, I'll, let me take just a minute. And I, some of you have seen this before, but some of you may not have seen it. So just a little while ago, before I started the broadcast, I took a picture of my painting. Two pictures, in fact. A picture, a close-up of the bride's head and a close-up of the groom's head. Okay? And then in my phone... There's an app called Photo Collage. And you go back in previous broadcasts and find me describing this, but it's been a while. And essentially, I did in my phone, let me try not to confuse this. So here's a picture of my painting, right? And here's the photograph I have. So I put them side by side. And already, just by doing that, I typically see a number of corrections that need to be made. But I'd go one step further. Again, in my phone, and all of you guys, the camera on your phone is capable of doing all kinds of editing. Many people have no idea. They just take pictures and never do anything. So if that's you, surprise, surprise, your camera is capable of doing all kinds of things. Most of you, I presume, do some editing, so you'll be able to track with me. So in my phone, then, I take this image and I flop it horizontally, so it's now a mirror image. Right? This is a mirror image. So Saturday night, you know, I spent a couple hours, several hours, doing this painting and always looking at this painting this way. But when I flip it and see it in mirror image, instantly my eyes are fresh. That's the main point I want to make. The biggest challenge to doing good portraits is what I call portrait blindness. After so many minutes, and it doesn't take very long, 25, 30 minutes, say, after so many minutes of staring at a painting, you and I, the artist, can no longer see our mistakes. We're so accustomed to seeing it the way it is, we're blind to our mistakes. The number one solution is sleep on. Go to bed, get up the next day, you come back, go, egads, what was I thinking? <laughs> number two solution is to look at it in a mirror. So this is essentially a high-tech mirror. And um, so I can see my mistakes. Let me put this on a clipboard and hold this up right now. I, usually, I normally don't stand here at my easel doing this, but I'll, I'll do it right now uh, just so that you can 
follow along with what I'm doing. I wonder if I can get this this clipboard to stay here. Close enough. All right. So I'm not going to walk you through this too much, but just a little, little bit. The first thing that I noticed about that was a discrepancy between the photographs. See, I want to make my painting match this. The first thing I noticed was I completely or not, I largely missed this X for or Z formation right here. Oh, yes, uh, Uncle's giving us another method that you can do in Photoshop. Exactly, exactly. There are other ways. Um, so I drew it. In this case, I have a, an ink, a white ink pen. Sorry to be, again, weird, esoteric, but this is, this is not an art tool. This is just an office supply product. Um, and I have it un available. The other uh, crazy thing I had, kid, this, this crazy four-color pen that children like to play with, you know? So I make it an adjustment and I number it number one so that's going to be number one uh, number two and I'm going to switch to a red pen here I realized that this corner of his head and now I've done it my clipboard is in the way this corner of his head comes down is missing so I need to make it the top of his head a little bit higher and I'm going to label that number two and I'm just crazy OCD so I literally put a box around my number and draw an arrow. Can you see that? Hang on, let me bring you in real close just for a second so you can see very well what I'm doing here. So the C number one and an arrow pointing to that and number two here is an arrow pointing to that. All right, so I'm not gonna continue this much longer because it, it typically takes me I would say uh, 10 minutes, no more than that. And I'll come up with, on average, 15 to 20 changes that need to be made. So let me continue. Again, I'm just looking at comparing. And I, I have fresh eyes. That's the key thing. Because the mirror image fool's trick surprises me. If So that's why I don't start down here because... I'm already burned out on this photograph, on this painting, and I don't see my mistakes as readily as I do on the mirror image, okay? Now, if you don't want to do any of this, please, please, I beg of you, look at your painting in a mirror. Carry it into the bathroom or whatever, in a stand, turn it around and look at it. Okay, so that's number one. I'm going to call number two. I see that this line, his temple uh, is uh, on my painting is too far in. I didn't need to draw that line, but so I'm going to move his temple out. I'm going to call that number three. And then his ear needs to be reconstructed on the outside of that. I'm going to call that number four. Okay. Now, uh, the next thing is his eyebrow is a little bit too fat at this end. So I'm going to make his eyebrow, the inside of his eyebrow is very accurate, but the outside here is too fat. Fat. So I'm going to thin it down and mark that number four. What next? What next? What next? Um, I'm going to go to the bottom of his nose and, and go back to my white pen and say there's a long, straight, dark mark for his nostril there. And I'm going to call that number five. Now, again, this is me and my personality being a little bit OCD. You don't need to do all this numbering and putting a box around it. I, I confess, I admit, this is me just having a routine, a formula. Uh, it works for me, so I'm going to stick with it. And then the top of his nostrils a little bit more pronounced. That's number six. Now, let's look at the eye itself. Um, it looks to me like it's in the right location. It's just a little bit too deep. So I'm going to skinny it up this way, and I'm going to call that number seven, and I'm going to draw an arrow both to the bottom and the top, reminding me that what I'm doing is making that more skinny, All right? Let me just do a couple more here before I show you what I do next. Um, this broom, frankly, was a, he was not tall, but he was... I would say almost strikingly handsome in a very uh, masculine kind of way. I guess that's what handsome sort of means, really. 
but a very strong jaw and chin and just, uh, uh, and I'm sorry the photograph doesn't do him justice, but he was, he was uh, I would say, a strikingly handsome young man. And so I, I certainly want to do him fair, so to speak. Okay, but that's, oh wait, let me label that. That The jawline comes down that way a little bit more, and I'm going to call that all the way up to number eight, okay? Number eight, silly me with a square around it and then an arrow. Of course, you don't need to do any of this, but you, in my opinion, let me give you a little bit of my opinion. I, I witness and I watch, you know, I judge shows. I, I lead two painters groups essentially every month where I'm, okay? So I see a lot of amateur painting, or I'd rather use the word early journey people, a number of whom are trying to do portraits. And uh, I think the number one impression I have of early, and this would have applied to me years ago, <coughs> the number one impression I have <coughs> of early journey portrait painters, wannabe portrait painters, is they, number one, don't realize how hard it is, how much work it's going to be, how hard it is to get good, how much work you have to do to capture a perfect likeness. It's like they want to do 70% of the work and hit a home run. And uh, I work hard. I work. Let me let me show you. Here's, so here's, I just showed this earlier today, my earlier broadcast. But here's here's a one of my winning portraits that I am darn proud of. And, oh, and I stuck the photograph on the back here. I'm proud of this mostly because of the composition and the lighting and everything else. Oh, and I'm sorry this isn't bigger. Um, do I still have the... Nope, I threw it out. Anyway, um, I, am, I am very pleased with the likeness of both faces. And the process that I'm showing you right now with the number one, two, three, four, five, I did that entire process twice on this couple. Where I took a picture of the painting, did everything I'm talking about, and I did that whole thing two different times, okay? So, again, just... You don't take my word for it, but doing portraits is hard. And unless you're a freaking genius, and some people are, and you seem to have a gene or a screw loose. Um, so again, you don't have to do my silly little thing. Any, and there are other ways to, so to speak, cheat. There are other photo mechanical tricks that are even more controlled than this, like where you just trace and so on. And that, those are okay. Um, the reason I use this technique, I think, is because it, it continues to stretch my powers of observation. My, my skill gets stretched. So let me go back to this just for a minute, and I want to emphasize one more thing before I go on. And that is, I've, and this is my mirror image. It would be very difficult to take all these markings and to translate them directly to the painting because it's uh, they're flopped. It's a mirror image. So then the next thing I do is I take all of these marks that I, some of which I've written down here, and I go back to number one. Number one is this corner here, and I don't just copy this to this image. I look at this, then I look at the photograph. So I'm second guessing, double checking, triple checking again and making adjustments right left last time i did it in white and this time i'm doing it red so you know, no no big deal and then a very straight line right there okay so that was my i'm going to use the white pen because i'm going to draw the number so that's all i'm going to do i just want to show you that i take the mirror image notes, and I didn't finish here, by the way, I got up to number eight, and there's probably another 10 at least changes, I would guess, that I'm gonna make here. Then I transfer all of them, all, checking with the photograph. You know, I don't just go straight from here to here. I go through the photograph and see if I agree with myself. <laughs> and, and make the notes, and so the next one is his eyebrow, making it thinner. This white ballpoint pen, it, does, it doesn't work as, as you can imagine. It, it's a gel, so it doesn't work. And I'm trying to write uphill. Um, 
I'll go back to the color pen. Okay. And was that number two? No, that was number four. So I'm, forgive me, I'm going out of order here. But I take all these notes and transfer them to here. And then, and this is, I'll, I'll end this at this point here that in the broadcast here. I'll, of course, I'll do the same thing to the bride, to the woman. And um, when all of my notes have been transferred from the mirror image to this image, then typically I'll take this print and just tape it to my dry painting right here. So it's very helpful that the painting is dry. And then I begin making the, tr the adjustments. I look at number one, I fix it. Two, fix it. Three, fix it. All the way up to number 15, 16, 17, 18, 20, whatever it is. Usually at the end of that process, I've got a very good likeness. Sometimes it's not perfect, in which case, as I showed you a few minutes ago, I'll actually go through the whole thing again. And often I'm a little dismayed <laughs> when I see the mirror image second time around. It's like, dang, there's still so many things I'm still off. I have done it three times, several times. I don't know if I've, I don't think I've ever done it four times, this, this process. I know I've done it three, several times. Anyway, I hope that helps a little bit. Now, bef um, before I leave the broadcast and leave this painting, um, this painting can be helped quite a bit by some glazing. Um, Hang on, I'm trying to decide. No, I won't. I won't do it now. Let me just talk about it. You're getting so much glare. Let me see if this makes it. Better. Yeah, yeah, that's actually a little bit better. Um, this painting will be helped by warmth. So again, yellow orange, very faint, faint yellow orange here, and then rubbing off with a rag, of course, to get it to the right degree. Um, this painting will be definitely helped by darkening, vignetting the corners. They are a little bit already, but they can be more. All these corners. And let me just point out that this was a particularly challenging uh, venue to paint in because although it was lovely as a reception, when you were there in person, you walked in and went, oh, this is so beautiful. <laughs> but it did not make a good painting because there was no striking architectural element, no big doors, no window, no big windows, these windows, um, no stairs, no spiral staircase, you know, no big fireplace, nothing like that. Very, very plain corporate box. And again, it was lovely in person, just doesn't make a good uh, painting. So I had to work a little bit. This is, this is uh, indicative of reflective of the real uh, life fixtures that were there in the space. And there were these windows and uh, all the rest of the room had sheer curtains hanging down with, with sparkly lights and light shining up and so on. So again, it looked beautiful in person, but it didn't make for a good painting. So um, a, a real challenge. You may, I don't know if you can see this, these blue and, and particularly blue and green lines, this right here. Um, there's some others down here. I had also red and, and orange lines in here, but they didn't show up as much. That is, these were added, those marks were added with an, with an oil stick. Um, it's about half an inch thick. It's an oil paint stick. And I made those marks right before I did the oil glaze. So every, the painting is acrylic. And then I made those marks. And then I did oil glaze. And I just rub it uh, with a brush till these are faint but not disappear. And those, the reason, this is a, a trick that I've learned, especially with wedding paintings. Anytime a, a, the setting is bland. There's not quite enough, go there's not as much going on here as I would like. And when that happens, I infuse the subject with more abstraction there. Does that make sense? So these marks, there's also pencil lines up here that are purely abstract. And um, like here, I don't know if you can see this, there's a, you know, complete abstract pencil line right there. What's, the, and here's a great big one. Uh, over here, going all the way down to the bride's dress. Do you see that? Purely abstract. Why? Because the, the painting needs more. Here's another abstract pencil mark right here. Do you see that kind of a Y shape right there? 
Um, and again, in a big one over here that lines up actually reduplicates the, the green abstract mark. So this, there's a number of lines. that They are not, the, the, the hotel uh, ballroom did not have anything like that on the wall. Okay, that's pure abstraction. Again, because the, the uh, architecture of the room was quite bland, so I infuse it. I, I put stuff on the painting. It isn't there. And very few people will look at it and say, what's that? If I do it with uh, authority, confidence, and, and so on, and these are not complete. Um, I'll, I'll continue to work on them a little bit. Uh, one of the things I do, I guess, since I've talked this far, I might as well tell you. Let's, let's go back to this, this pencil line right here. I don't know if you can see that or not. Um, but that's pretty much laying, except for in the, on the bride's dress, it's laying right on the surface of the painting. Like there's no paint on top of it. And that makes it look artificial or contrived. But I'll actually mix up a opaque color matching this and paint up close to that line on both sides here and there. So then that pencil line will no longer be on the surface of the painting, it'll be inside the painting and then it looks good. Like this green mark right here uh, looks okay because it's not on the surface, it's in the painting. And I'll actually work on that a little bit. And I, this was green abstract and I added this these green marks uh, to, to partner with that abstraction. I'm probably getting way too deep in the weeds, but the principle is if the setting is too bland and I, I don't have any choice, I can't, I, I can't take the bride and groom and put them in front of Taj Mahal. I can't put them in front of a gigantic, you know, Victorian fireplace. I can't because it wasn't there. So I have to work with what I've got. And so one of the tricks that I use then is uh, in sneaking in a uh, little more abstract elements. And, and again, I, I can't imagine anybody complaining about that because um, it just looks good. All right, that's all I'm going to do for this broadcast. Thank you for watching. Thank you for commenting. And uh, I don't know when I've got to go this afternoon over to the church to work on the big mural project. I'm showing you my watch, showing you how little time I have to do that. <laughs> but it's good to have you on board. Thanks for watching.